Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Governor. You really set us straight on the issues uh, with great clarity. It's now my pleasure to introduce Steve Moore, who's one of the really great spokespersons in America today for limited government, free markets, and can you believe he hails from Illinois? <laughs> Uh, Steve received a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and he met a great mentor professor, Julian Simon. Uh, Julian Simon, for those of you who don't know, was a brilliant and sensible economist, terms we don't usually describe economists with, <laughs> and he was an early skeptic uh, of global warming. He also wrote a book on the ultimate resource. Uh, which is the human mind, the human person, long forgotten in our democratic society. Um, Steve and Julian eventually wrote a book on how life keeps getting better, and they make a very compelling case. In spite of our politicians, life continues to get better for most of us, and Steve was talking that he may up update that at some point. Because <laughs> um, we tend to forget that uh, with, with all the political shenanigans that are going on. Uh, he also received a master's degree in economics uh, from George Mason University, uh, which is well known for public choice, uh, explaining why we have big government and big bureaucracies. He was the founder of the Club for Growth, former member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board, and now currently is a distinguished visiting fellow at Heritage University with a project for economic growth, something that we are all hungry for, Steve. Um, Steve would have been a brilliant uh, economist without all his great mentors, but the fact that he had Julian Simon and also Ed Fulner and Art Laffer really filled out his career and made him the leading spokesman for economics, growth, and limited government in America today. How about a big Civitas welcome for Steve Moore? Um, let me start by saying, I don't know how many of you saw the news this morning, um, but um, Nancy Pelosi, Barbara Streisand, Alex Baldwin, and Michael Moore have all announced that if Donald Trump wins the election, they will leave the country. <laughs> So in Civitas, let me just say something about Civitas. I, I've worked with uh, with the folks at Civitas since you got started. But how many years has it been now? You know, six, seven, 15, two, 2005. Five, five. So it's been an amazing run. And uh, I'm such a huge advocate of what the state think tanks around the country do. I do travel a lot and on the road all the time. And I, I just think one of the, when we talk about our conservative free market movement, you know, the one area where we have much better infrastructure in place than the left does is at the state level, although the left is starting to catch up with us, Bob. I mean, you can probably see that here in North Carolina, where uh, all these George Soros-funded um, organizations are spreading around. But we're still in the lead because we have an amazing people who run these groups, and we have amazing donors like the people in this room who make Civitas possible. And it's the reason, frankly, that uh, you were able to do what you've done. I mean, what, it, it really is true that I do travel around the country. I talk about what's happened during North Carolina all the time. I say, look, if they can reform unemployment insurance and your welfare benefit programs and your, you know, fix your tax system, among all the other things you talked about, you know, we can do this in other states. And my God, I, I, I come from Illinois. <laughs> I mean, Illinois is about the most backward state uh, in the country. And we're really, even we're trying to borrow some of the uh, some of the ideas there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the economy. I am a, I am a Donald Trump um, senior economic advisor. He's going to give a major speech on Thursday uh, in New York um, that I'll be going to. Um, you know how to revive this American economy. It was so interesting when you were uh, when you were talking. By the way, when you were talking about um, politicians who don't tell the truth. Gee, what a, what a shocking thing! <laughs> um, you know, uh, we're doing some of this debate preparation now for the uh, for the. Um, 
debate, and um, this is not for public uh, distribution to sort of keep this quiet. But you know, when Donald Trump said, you know, we were talking about how she's going to respond to a lot of this stuff, she's going to have to answer for the email scandal and Benghazi and for the Clinton Foundation, and of course she's going to deny it all. And I want Donald Trump to look her right, look the American people in her right eye, and say. Hillary Clinton, will you take a lie detector test? <laughs> and, uh, let's see what her uh, response is to that. Um, but uh, anyway, we have a major economic speech that's coming up, and I'll talk for just a few minutes about what we're doing. But I want to talk a little bit about why Americans are so cranky right now, because you're quite correct as what's happening in North Carolina. It's amazing that you've been able to do what you've done in North Carolina. You're creating these tailwinds for the economy. Unfortunately, you're facing a federal government that's giving you uh, headwinds. And the fact that you're able to create these jobs and, um, and have the kind of record here in North Carolina is an amazing thing. I wish it were happening in all the other states, but frankly, it isn't. And I want to kind of walk you through some of the uh, some of uh, the national statistics on the economy because I think it explains where we have been um, deficient. So let me uh, let me start with this. This is kind of the heart of the matter. I think this explains everything about why there is anger and rage among voters and why they're so disappointed with the way the U.S. economy is performed. And the way I like to put this and explain it to people you know, who are non-economists is to, is to say that you know, in my lifetime, most of our lifetimes, there have been two periods of great economic crisis. Um, the first was the 1970s. How many of you are old enough to remember when we had 20% mortgage interest rates and 16% inflation and the U.S. economy was going uh, to hell at the end of the Jimmy Carter era? Uh, and so Reagan came in and inherited this incredibly economic crisis that was handed to him by Carter. But it's also true that Barack Obama came in office during an economic crisis. We had the Great Recession, the real estate markets had melted down and so on. And, and so there's no question, we lost 8 million jobs during the Great Recession of 2000. 789. And so Obama and Reagan both inherited periods of uh, where the U.S. economy was just flat on its back. And that sets up kind of not natural, a nice natural experiment, doesn't it? Because when you look at what Reagan did and what Obama did when they came into office, you couldn't really find two uh, presidents who had more differing philosophies of governance, right? So Reagan came in and, and we, you know, I say we because I was able, uh, you know, proud enough to work for the different in 1987, 88, but we cut tax rates, we deregulated the economy, we got inflation under control by pulling back on the money supply. And in one sentence, remember what Reagan used to say. Remember his famous saying that he said in that debate with uh, Jimmy Carter in October of, uh, of uh, 1980. He said, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And that was sort of the Reagan philosophy. And con you know, contrast that with Barack Obama, and I would say by extension Hillary Clinton, and what is their philosophy? Their philosophy has essentially been, whatever the problem is, there is a government solution to, to, uh, to deal with it. And so we've seen, and think about what we've lived through in just the last seven years. I mean, remember we had the big <coughs> bailouts of the auto companies and the, and the financial services companies, and by the way, that wasn't just uh, uh, Obama, that was uh, George W. Bush who did that as well. And then you had the, um, you had Obamacare, and then you had, remember that eight hundred thirty billion dollars stimulus plan that was supposed to create all of the all, all of the government jobs and then the shuffle by the jobs, and then we had um, th the big tax increases on the rich. We had three minimum wage increases. We had uh, eight uh, eight to nine trillion dollars of new borrowing at the federal level, and then we had the Fed just deluge the U.S. economy with cheap dollars and zero interest rates, and so. In sum, what, what Obama has done is thrown the entire liberal playbook, every single possible uh, nick and poop idea that liberals have, they do at this recession, right? I mean, there's really not, not much left that they could possibly come up with. And so now what, what we do is we compare the results. We have, you know, the, the Obama you know, pro-government policies versus the Reagan get the government out of the way policies. And what you're looking at in this graph, I think it explains everything. This blue line is the rate of growth of the U.S. economy since the, re since the recession ended in June of 2009. So it's about, it has been a lengthy recovery. There's no question about it. We have to give Obama credit for that. It's been, we're now in the seventh year of recovery, so it's been lengthening. It's been, it's been lengthy, but it's been incredibly flat and flimsy. Uh, so the economy is growing at 15% or a little less than 2% per year. 
The next line you're looking at there, the blue line, is the average rate of growth for a recession, uh, coming out of a recession during a recovery. And we've had something like eight recessions since the end of World War II. So this is looking at what normally happens. And you can see the economy has generally grown about twice as fast during a normal re recovery than the Obama recovery. And then finally, you look at what happened to Reagan, and you see that the economy is growing by 36%, or almost two and a half times faster under Reagan than it did under Obama. Now, these numbers may not seem like they're very important. And what's the difference between a 15% rate of growth versus a 36% rate of growth? But let me show you what, what this means. So if you look at the top, uh, what I call this is the growth gap. And this is what is antagonizing voters and why they're so angry. That is to say that if we had a Reagan-style recovery over the last seven years, and not an Obama recovery, the U.S. economy today would be $3 trillion larger. Now, $3 trillion, ladies and gentlemen, is larger than the entire GDP of Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. That's how much we are behind in terms of this recovery. Now, people say, well, gee, you know, we've had this great uh, job growth and so on. Well, not really. Not really. If we had an average rate of recovery, uh, if it weren't for states like North Carolina, these numbers would be much worse. Obama's running around the country saying, you know, that, oh gosh, we've created 11 million jobs. That's true. But if we had a normal recovery, we would have about 18 million jobs. So we're about 6 million jobs behind where we should be. And one of the things I always say, is there anybody in this room who really believes that the U.S. unemployment rate in this country is 5%? I mean, that is the biggest lie out there, right? Now, you've got an especially low rate in North Carolina, but these, these numbers are artificially low because of what? Because we're not including the 94 million people who dropped out of the workforce. And this is something I think most of you are familiar with. But this is a huge, severe problem for the U.S. economy. The young people are just not working. By the way, the biggest decline in the workforce in terms of percentage terms has been young people, people between the ages of 18 and 30. I have a 23 year old at home right now. He's living in my basement. I can't get an hour. I cannot try everything you know, to work. I mean, everybody has that problem, partly because there just aren't uh, that many jobs, and partly there's just something about these millennials. I just can't stand that generation. <laughs> they feel so entitled. Anyway, we're just, we just haven't seen the kind of recovery that we should. Um, I want to switch now to what you've got in North Carolina, to put this in a, in a perspective about the 50 states. Because I always say the more I'm involved in policy, uh, the more I am uh, so impressed with the ingeniousness of our founding fathers that they set up this system. It is, when you think about America, what it is economically, is it's a 50-state free trade zone, right, where goods and services are, are um, provided across state lines. The state of North Carolina cannot impose a tariff against goods that are produced in South Carolina and so on. And so you have a 50-state free trade zone where states like North Carolina, you can't impose a tariff against South Carolina, but you can compete against South Carolina. You can compete against Virginia. You can compete against Ohio and Michigan and Saudi Arabia and China and India and so on. And this has created, I mean, competition is a good thing, right? This is why we believe this, in, in one of the reasons, as conservatives, we believe in, in federalism, to, to bring the power down to the lowest level of government so that you have competition. And so what we found in a book that I wrote with, uh, you mentioned about Laffer, he and I just wrote a book last year called The Wealth of States, about why are some states becoming wealthier than others? Why is North Carolina got it right and my home state of Illinois got it so wrong? And so to summarize what we found in our book in a, in a very 400-page book with all sorts of econometric analysis, is what we found is that every single day in America, 1,000 people on net, 1,000 people are leaving the blue states of America, the, the liberal states, and they're moving to the red states of America, the more conservative states. And North Carolina is certainly one of these states that is winning in this competition for jobs and people and uh, capital. And uh, so much so, by the way, you know that the general drift of this is that the, the, for the most part, people are leaving the Northeast and the Midwest and where they're moving here to the South. And they're moving to North Carolina, they're moving to South Carolina, to Florida, Tennessee, and states like that. Texas, of course. And, um, you know, that's a big thing. By the way, when the book came out, I kind of funny story, I'll never forget this. I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and it was a big, big civics meeting with, you know, about uh, 400 people there. I was talking about the book. And, you know, I said, you know, that all these people are moving from the north to the south, and, you know, and I got a little carried away, and I banged my fist on the table, and I said, and what I'm trying to tell you people is the south will rise again. <laughs> 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 
Mr. Moore, you mean militarily? I said, no, no, we can't. Yeah. Like, there is that. There is a kind of war about who you know, the states, but it is, a, it is a, an economic war. Right? That states, you compete against other states. Now, let me summarize what we found with this one um, kind of interesting chart here. Um, it turns out that the four largest states in the United States, Florida, Texas, California, and New York, um, one out of three Americans live in these four states. So how they view economically has an outsized impact on how the country does. And as fate would have it, we've got another interesting, wonderful, natural experiment here, right? This is experiment number two. We compare how red states do, Florida and Texas, versus California and New York. You can't get much more liberal, right, than California and New York. And uh, so what we do is look at you know, jobs and migration and so on. And I'll just show you the migration statistic, because this is pretty amazing. What this is showing is that Florida and Texas over the last 10 years have gained about a million people in that migration. That's a, bit, that's a big number of people. Whereas look what's happening in California and New York. California and New York have lost over a million people. And by the way, how do you screw up California? Right? I mean, California is an amazing place, right? I mean, beautiful mountains, beautiful beaches, beautiful weather, beautiful women. I mean, there's nothing not right about California, and yet people are leaving. People are leaving this idyllic place in America. And, uh, and so that's an amazing thing. Uh, New York is just hopeless, right? I mean, New York is just a hopeless situation. But uh, I will say this, that, um, and by the way, you must meet people from New York all the time. Here yeah. I mean, people who move from North Carolina, from New York. Because I, I talk to people all the time. I'm moving, leaving from North Carolina, South Carolina. But um, so I, one kind of fun story, I don't know if I've ever told you this one about. But you all know this. How many of you have ever heard of this account named Paul Krugman? He's a, a, a very left wing. I uh, wrote for this uh, left wing rag called the New York Times. And he's very influential. He's probably the most influential liberal economist in the country. And, you know, he became um, impossible to live with because about five years ago he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> So, so I debated him at a big event um, this past summer in, in Las Vegas, 3,000 people there, and we debated socialism versus capitalism. And I showed him this chart, and I said, Paul, oh, you've got to explain this to me. I said, because these states like California and New York, they do everything that you advise them to do in your college. They raise the minimum wage, they have high caps on the rich. Uh, you know, they, they don't allow right to work. By the way, right to work is a huge factor in where businesses move. Uh, they don't have, um, you know, they haven't reformed the tort system. They haven't done the kinds of things you've done on unemployment benefits and so on. Uh, whereas Texas and Florida do exactly that. By the way, what is the income tax rate in Texas and Florida? Zero. Zero. There is no income tax there. You're getting down there. I want to see one of my missions in life. Uh, Lieutenant Governor and Bob is to make North Carolina the 10th no-income tax state in America. So I said, you know, how do you explain yourself, Bob? And he gets up there, and he's a very arrogant guy. And he said, well, Steve, it's so obvious that with your pea-sized brain, you don't understand this now. He said, there's a very simple explanation why people are moving from the north to the south. He said it's because of the weather. <laughs> now that's not a completely stupid thing. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got beautiful weather here in North Carolina. This beats the hell out of being in Chicago today, for example, or you know, or in Rochester, New York, or in Minneapolis. But um, then I just said, you know, I, I think you'll really love this. So I got up and I said, you know, probably right. I don't, I don't teach at MIT. I don't write a weekly column at the New York Times. I don't have the Nobel Prize. But gee, there's just something that really, you know, shocking. You know, I just still don't get this. I said. If people are leaving, you know, but this is all because of the weather, then gee, why are people leaving San Diego and going to Houston? There's nothing worse than San Diego to Houston. Right. You know, no, he didn't have any response to that, right? He doesn't know all that. But the point is, when you get the policies right, you grow. It's very simple. Now, I thought I'd show you this because this is amazing. This is a tribute to what you guys have done. There is no state. That is made more progress. Actually, there is one more state. One state that's made more, more progress than you have. That's Indiana. So North Carolina and Indiana are the two states that have made the most progress. Anyway, by the way, what this is is Lapper and I put together for Alec, which is a, a state legislative group, a ranking of which states have the best economic climate for business, uh, jobs, and so on. And North Carolina, I think. Uh, we started this, we've done this for eight or nine years now. We started this, North Carolina was 24. So this is amazing, you moved from 24 to two. That's an amazing accomplishment. Why in the world would you change horses? 
Right. I mean, is that, would that be the dumbest thing in the world? I mean, you've got amazing policies in place here. Eric and Indiana the same way. They've got two great governors, too. They have uh, Mitch Daniels, who's now the president of Purdue, and, and Mike Pence, who's awesome, and he could be the next vice president of the United States. And it just shows leadership matters. You put it in place the right way. And then look at these states that are just stuck here at the bottom. I mean, it's so sad, isn't it? Illinois, Connecticut, California, New Jersey, Vermont, New York. These are places where the politicians just don't have their trade tables in the upright line. <laughs> so I always say, you know, what is the key to prosperity for America? Is to make America like, look less like New York and more like North Carolina. And by the way, Utah, what is it with the, the, the Mormons? I mean, we've done this eight years in a row, and Utah is always number one. You, when you become governor, sir, you have to move North Carolina above Utah and your brother. Um, so this is just showing you know, uh, these effects of these things. I want to go back and mention the other thing that's going on in the economy that I think is so important where we have a great opportunity, that's with energy. And if you want to understand, I just had a book that came out uh, this year that I wrote with uh, one of the um, energy experts at this group called the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is one of the sister organizations of Civitas. And we looked at what's called fueling freedom. And we looked at what's happening with the energy sector. What, how, how does it explain what's happening with the American economy? And the answer is it explains everything. You know, and so if you look at this chart, you see that brown line, that's total employment in the United States. And you can see here's the recession, right, where we lost those 7 million jobs. Uh, it peaked back, peaked in around uh, November 2009. And then a very, very, very slow and, and lag, uh, a weak recovery. And then it wasn't until about 2014 we regained every job that we had lost. So this was a horrific recession, a very slow recovery. And then look at the green line. That's the employment in the oil and gas industry. Um, and what is that a result of? That is a result of the most amazing um, revolution in energy in American history that we're living through right now, and that's the shale oil and gas revolution. And it is it has changed everything. So nobody would have predicted this to happen 10 years ago. It's a perfect example why central planning never works, because even people in the energy industry didn't see this coming. But now, because of things like um, horizontal drilling and um, amazing new you know, uh, technologies they use, like <gasps> fracking and so on, that are just making the availability of amazing amounts of energy resources. And you can see, I mean, the irony of this chart is that without the oil and gas revolution, Barack Obama never would have been allowed to re-elect the president. Right? And it's, that's so ironic, isn't it? Because this is the industry that he hates the most. And yet, this is why we uh, why we have any recovery at all. Now, the reason I show you this is because I'm a big believer that this is just the beginning stages of um, making America. Let me put it very simple: if we get it right, and we elect a president, and we elect people in Congress and the Senate who want to promote American energy, we have the capacity to be the next Saudi Arabia. We can become the energy, not just, I used to say we could be energy independent in the next five years, and now I say it differently, because being energy independent, we can go well beyond that. We can be the energy dominant country in the world if we get this right. And by the way, I am not talking about building windmills, right? <laughs> I'm not using <laughs> coal, our nuclear power, and so, and so forth. Um, I want to show, for those who say, well, wait, what about windmills? Um, by the way, here's, here is one of the dividends of this, and this is, this is an amazing thing. Look at what's happening with price of oil. We know this from the law of supply and demand. What happens when you have an increase in the supply of something? What happens to its price? It falls. And as America has produced more and more American energy, you've, you've had a major, this is like the equivalent of a tax cut for the American consumer, and I estimate this to be about $150 billion a year. Every penny reduction in the price of gasoline at the pump puts another billion dollars into the hands of American consumers that they can use to buy other things. And by the way, this has huge consequences for American manufacturing. You know, one of those things, you're seeing a manufacturing renaissance here in, uh, in, uh, in North Carolina. Manufacturing is coming back in America. We're making things again. And one of the reasons for that is, guess what country in the world today has the lowest energy prices? We do. And that's a huge advantage of what we have over China, India, Germany, and these other countries. So that's a good news story. But then I just thought I'd show you this. I mean, here's just a perfect example of what Civitas stands for and the stupidity of government policy. So over the last eight years, eight or nine years, actually it goes back to the second term of Bush, because Bush was terrible on energy policy too. So we've had two presidents who've been just terrible on energy policy. 
George W. Bush and Obama's been even worse. And what we've done over the last 10 to 12 years is we've spent $150 billion, $150 billion, Bob, subsidizing wind and solar power. Subsidizing wind and solar power. Now this all took place at the time we went through this massive increase in, in energy output with oil and gas. And by the way, the reason that wind and solar are not probably going to make it in the next 10 years is because natural gas is as cheap as it's ever been, and it's a good cheap uh, source. So here's the amazing thing. After spending $150 billion, here's what's happened to the growth of our renewable energy. Look what happened to oil and gas, the one that actually pays taxes rather than consuming taxes. So. Uh, let me just throw this out there to you all, because I think you're probably a pretty well-educated group on this stuff. Um, after spending $150 billion in wind and solar power, anybody want to take a guess at what percentage of our energy today comes from wind and solar power? Did somebody say two? I did. You did? Sir, you were way behind the times. Up to 2.8%. <laughs> so, I mean, what are we talking about? Where do we get? Where do we get most of our? Uh, let, let, let me just tell you one other quick, fun story. In the book, I, you know, I give a lot of talks on college and uh, high school campuses, uh, and I talk about energy all the time. And, and high school and college campuses, the green agenda is just completely out of control. It's unbelievable. And, and so, it, all these, all clean energy, it's so wonderful. It's going to change up. And, and then I say to these kids, um, you guys think this is so wonderful. Where do you get your electricity from? It's just like, is this kind of idiot or what? We just stick the thing around the <laughs> <laughs> electricity comes out. That's where most Americans have no idea where they get their electric power from. What's the number one source of electric power? Power in America today. Coal. Well, coal and natural gas are about you. We get about 35% of our electricity from coal. By the way, this country was built on coal. And i got to say this, I'm going to do one advertisement for Donald Trump. When Donald Trump is, is elected president, he is going to win this election. I told him 50 times, every time I went, I said, Donald, the first executive order that you're going to sign, the first hour you're in the Oval Office, is a, is a bill to repeal the clean power plant. Let's put 50,000 coal miners back in the job. <laughs> Our energy from oil, from from coal, natural gas, nuclear power, and so on. So this is a huge opportunity for us. Let's get this right. Um, final point, and then I, I think I probably used up more time than I should. The other issue that I just wanted to bring up very quickly is the issue of tax reform. And I just wanted to let you know because I've been working on this with uh, Larry Kudlow now for the last uh, month or so for Donald Trump. And by the way. You know, you want to see, I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, Donald Trump isn't conservative enough, blah, blah, His three chief economic advisors are Arthur Lapper, Larry Kudlow, and Steve Moore. That's a, that's a pretty good team. <laughs> and so uh, we put this this tax program together, and it's exactly what you've done in North Carolina. But we're going to do it nationally. So you talk, I'll show you one last chart, and uh, we might have some time to talk about this stuff later. But, oh, by the way, this is for the uh, tax reform. This is Hillary's new tax reform. Wow. Um, <laughs> 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 it can't get much simpler than that. Um, but I want, this is really an amazing chart. Um, this is an amazing chart. So we're going to cut the business tax in this country from the highest business tax rate in the world to the lowest. And this is why what you've done is so important. Because at the federal level, we have a 35% corporate tax rate. No other country in the world has a tax rate on its corporations uh, like this. Donald Trump is right when he said, our federal tax system was like it was written by our enemies, by the people who are trying to rob us of jobs. There's no question about it. So we're at 35%. Most states, what did you say you're at now? Three and a half? Three. That's, most states are at six, so you're half what other. So when you combine the state um, levy, we're at a close to a 40% rate in the United States. And you can see that's the black line there. We haven't changed our tax system. Some states have, like North Carolina, very wisely. But at the federal level, we haven't changed this in 30 years, not since 1986. Now look at what's happened to the rest of the world. Those are those red pillars. That's the average for the, all of the countries that we compete with. And if you look at this, what are they doing? They're doing Reaganomics, right? They're cutting their tax rates year after year after year to become more competitive and to steal jobs from the United States. And that's what they're doing. How many of you have heard the term corporate inversion? How many of you are familiar with it? Yeah, that's this kind of term for companies that are leaving the United States 
and they're going to other nations because our tax rate is so much higher than theirs. So let me just mention some of them. They're living, and this is an abomination. We shouldn't tolerate this. Burger King, Medtronic, Walgreens, Pfizer, Johnson Control. I could probably mention 10 or 15 others. We've lost 25 of our Fortune 500 companies that are essentially renouncing their American citizenship, and they're going to Ireland, they're going to Canada, they're going to China, they're going to India. It's not as if we have a stretch and said, gee, why are they leaving? They're telling us why they're leaving. Right? They're leaving because you can pay a 15% tax, or not, not 15, 12.5% tax in Ireland, or you can pay 40% in the United States. You know what a lot of these CEOs say? I have a fiduciary duty to our shareholders to reduce our tax by moving out of the United States. What we're going to do is, because this doesn't work anymore, we're going to take that rate all the way from 40 down to 15. 15 and 30. Um, and one other quick thing about this. We're not only going to cut the tax for the corporation. This is something Donald Trump told us the first meeting he had. I do want to cut the corporate tax. I get this, he said, but we're not going to have a system that discriminates against small businesses. So every single small business in America, all 25 million small businesses in this great state of North Carolina, all over the country, are also going to get the 15% tax rate. Now that's going to bring so many jobs back to the United States. I mean, this is a great thing. You know, you mentioned Arthur Lapper. He's a mentor of mine. He said it so well, right, that um, when you tax something, you get less of it. When you tax something less, you get more. If we reduce our corporate tax rate, those businesses will come back. And I, just in, in ode to my great buddy Larry Cutlow, who I'm going to do a quick advertisement for him, you've got to get him to come to North Carolina. He has a new book out uh, on the Kennedy tax cuts. How many of you are aware of J John F. Kennedy cut tax rates? I know you are about So JFK, I mean, this is a great book. Larry Cutlow says, well, go out and get it right now. It's on, on uh, Amazon. I think he's number three on the list right now. It's called JFK. Reagan and the, uh, and the story of American prosperity. People don't understand that JFK believed in the supply side ideas that we're promoting uh, you know, at the Cato Institute, you're promoting at Civitas. Uh, and basically, Kennedy looked at this tax system, and he, he said this a few months before he was tragically assassinated. And I'm going to read it. I just, this is my favorite quote. You've probably seen this one before, Bob, but I just love this one. It is a paradoxical truth that tax rates are too high and tax revenues are too low and the soundest way to raise the revenues in the long run is to cut the rates out. I mean, is that beautiful or what? How many Democrats believe that today? Any, any Democrats in your legislature? <laughs> I mean, it's sad. They don't understand. I mean, how many Republicans believe that? And, you know, well, there's one. So this is, the, this is the point. We've got to cut. The, what Kennedy said 50 years ago is just as applicable 50 years ago as it is today. Um, I'm, I'm going to end by saying one thing. You mentioned um, you know, what's going on with this issue of the, of the transgender bathrooms and so on. And I just recently got back from China. I was in, how many of you have been to China, by the way? Raise your hands. Um, it, it, you got to go, if you haven't been there. You have to go. And China is an amazing place. Um, I think they've got a false prosperity. I think they maybe had a good recession. But you know, the China has grown at an amazing pace of growth for the last 25 years. It shows what happens when you move from you know, communism to, to they're not fully capitalistic, but they certainly moved in that direction. And they've been growing at 10, 12, 13% per year now for 25 years. And you know, the compounding effect of that growth rate means that they're becoming an economic superpower. And they are obsessed with becoming number one, right? All they think about is competitors. How, how can they replace the United States as the number one country in the world? And I was thinking about this when I was coming back, because look, this is, we are in an economic war with them, and who knows, if they grow, then look, they're saber rattling right now. We might be in a military war with them, God forbid, as well. And I'm thinking this, you know, frankly, I think here they are thinking about how they can make every single one of their industries, whether it's high technology or manufacturing or sciences, how they can become number one. And what are we talking about? Transgender bathrooms, right? I mean, there's something wrong with us, but we're not focused on the right ideas. And I think you'll love this, you know, when I met with the number four guy in the Chinese government, the economic minister there. Uh, you know, he's going on and on about how well the American economy, the uh, Chinese economy is doing. And, you know, at the end of the his little soliloquy went on and on. I said, well, you know, it's incredibly, you know, what you've done is I want to salute you. It's amazing how you've lifted so many people out of poverty and so on. I said, but not in my lifetime, sir. Not in my lifetime will China surpass the United States. 
and he got a grimace on that. He said, the reason for that is our Chinese are so much smarter than your Chinese. <laughs> 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 So I think we've got, thank you, Steve. I think we've got a quest, time for a couple of questions. So if anybody's, yeah. Hi, I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, with the media, the mass media, in the pockets of the lesson, how do you propose we get the word? You know, uh, first of all, obviously, the, the media is in the hip pocket of a lot. That I have to say that to uh, the um, all the deplorable people in this room. <laughs> um, but um, I don't think it's working. For them. I think, you know, I did a big uh, NPR thing a couple weeks ago on the media and the election. And I said, look, you people, not only, what's interesting about this election, I've been covering elections for 30 years. But the media's always been biased against our side, against free markets and conservatives. But the difference about this one is now they're, they're overt about it. I actually have to read, as part of my job, I have to read the New York Times on Sunday. Um, there was an article two or three weeks ago where the reporter simply said, Donald Trump is such a menace to our country that we have to stop even pretending that we're objective. You know, and, and so they're not even pretending that they're objective anymore. They are totally in Hillary's camp. And one of the things I said is, look, you, all, you folks in the media, your credibility is so shot with 50 to 60 percent Americans. Nobody's paying attention to them anymore, frankly. I mean, I don't think it's that big of a handicap. Uh, I think most Americans have tuned out. Now, but it's still a problem, though, because of the way, you know, they, they... But how many people have... I don't know, in North Carolina, how much have they covered the... Hillary Clinton has said some of the most outrageous things. A month ago, she said, we're going to put every coal miner out of business in this country. I mean, who says that? I mean, what an arrogant thing to say. Last week, she did say, she called us deplorable. She said we're racist, we're sexist, we're xenophobes, we're not Islamophobes. Uh, you know, and by the way, what was so interesting about that, go back and listen to the tape. I thought the most interesting thing about her comment, that was said in front of all of her millionaire and billionaire donors, right? That was a fundraising movie. And when she said that, what, did all, what was the reaction of the people in the audience? They laughed. They laughed. These people don't believe in working class. The reason we're going to win this election is because our movement is going to go to working class. We've got to go to union halls. We've got to go to working class in America and say, we're the ones who stand with you. These liberals, they, they thumb their noses at you, right? And that's what they were showing so effectively. So look, but we have other outlets now. We have talk radio. We have, you know, we have Fox News. We have all these other things that I think are, are leveling the playing field a little bit. But the media's credibility is completely shot. I'm, I'm, as a former journalist at the Wall Street Journal, I'm embarrassed, frankly, by that. How many of you are just embarrassed by these people? They're just, they're ridiculous. Any, I mean, last one, 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 when you get together with Art and Larry, you just walk us through kind of the process of you know, how you formulate policy, how you interact with a candidate, um, just to kind of like open the curtain and just show folks how, how you do it. So, you know, uh, I'm so lucky. I mean, our, our collaborator really is one of my mentors, and, and you mentioned Julian Simon as one of my others. And, you know, look, economics is not complicated, right? I mean, the only people who don't get what I'm talking about are people with PhDs in economics. <laughs> 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 this is really common sense. It is, right? This is common sense stuff. You don't have to have a PhD in economics to understand if you, you know, look, why do we tax cigarettes, right? Because we want people to smoke less, right? Well, look, if you want, if you're going to tax the rights so people smoke less, why would you tax people at work? Right? Because they're going to work less, right? So all of these dynamics are so obvious. My old boss used to put this so well, uh, Dick Armour. You all remember Dick Armour? He was the board of the House, one of the dearest, you know, just great, great leader of, of our country. And he used to say, he had so many great, we call them, uh, I don't know, axi axi axioms. And he used to say, you know, liberals love jobs, but they hate employers. You know, you can't have one without the other, right? You've got to connect the dots. I mean, when Hillary said, um, remember she said businesses don't create jobs? You don't remember when she said that? Where do they come from, Hillary? Government? And maybe that's what they, where they, maybe they do think that's where uh, jobs come from. When Barack Obama said, you didn't, remember what was his name, you didn't, uh, you didn't make that. Or you wouldn't, I mean, there is a, uh, there's an attitude in Washington, and 
frankly, among both parties, of, uh, of arrogance and incompetence and corruption. And, and that's, I think, what Trump really has tapped into. Now, your point about uh, Lapper and Cubo, I'll just tell you what, what we always talk about, the four pillars of growth. And I'll leave you with this. What are the four pillars of growth? Number one, cut tax rates and simplify your tax system and make it as easy as possible for people to comply with, and it doesn't destroy the economic activity. Yes, you have to raise revenues to fund your schools and your transportation and so on, but you want a system that's least, that, that, that uh, complicates things and distorts things as little as possible. You've done that in North Carolina, and you're re realizing the difference. Number two, so number one, you know, cut taxes to reduce the burden. Number two, get free trade. Right, free trade. This is one of the ones I'm working on with Donald Trump, right? Because you know Donald Trump is not a free trader. Uh, Hillary's not a free trader either, by the way. You know, she she's moved away from uh, trade as well. But look, free trade is very simple. When two people, we learned this from Adam Smith, remember 200 years ago. When two people or two countries voluntarily trade with each other, both parties are by definition better off. Right? And so many of the things that you know, the, the food we eat, all of the things that we have here. Some of it was built in China, some of it in India, some of it in Mexico, and all that, but we're, we're sending stuff all over the world. Now, the one thing I'll say that I do agree with Donald Trump on, I do think we need to renegotiate some of these areas so the other sides are playing on the rules. Right? China and Japan, what do we produce in America more and more? I mean, this is the research triangle, right? We're in the research triangle. You produce amazing products, technologies, patents, and all of these things. And what's, uh, what's happening is we're, and you know, in some cases it costs billions of dollars to produce a new drug or a vaccine, you know, a billion dollars investment to produce these things. We send them, or you know, a new computer uh, algorithm or, or uh, uh, you know, new uh, uh, software. We send it over to China, what do they do? They steal it. They effectively steal it. They don't honor our copyrights, our patents, our intellectual property. We need to get tough with China, I really think we do. But that's not to say we shouldn't be first free trade. Uh, the third is um, sound money. Sound money. And this is something that, you know, I think we've strayed away from with the Fed. The Fed is now, you know, acting as if they can, you know, like the Wizard of Oz, or push this button and that button. And we have flooded the, 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 uh, the country with cheap money. And what's the result? The flimsiest recovery we've ever had. So what do you want from your monetary policy? We want a strong and stable currency. We want the dollar of the day to be worth what it's going to be 10 years from now or 20 years from now. I think we've moved away from that. And fourth and finally, cut government spending. You know, cut government spending because government is um, subtracts. Now, you have to have the basics. You have to get the basics right. But, you know, God, do we need Solyndra? Do we need, you know, department? Do we need the Department of Education? I mean, does the Federal Department of Education improve the schools in North Carolina? I don't think that. One of the things you said that's so right is, and Trump is on this, by the way, Trump is saying, let's take $20 billion of that $60 billion in education spending, and you get nothing for it, right? We have a vast bureaucracy in Washington. You should, next time you're in Washington, go see the Department of Education. It's a massive structure. What are those people doing about it? I mean, really, what do they do? Uh, you, you don't need all those people, right? Let's just give the money to the parents especially the ones in low-income districts that have failing schools, and let them choose their own schools. What you're doing in North Carolina is another model for the country, so we can do that. By the way, my favorite story, you know, about wasteful government, you know the story about the, you know, it used to be when we, um, when we started the Department of Agriculture, which was like back 100 years ago, you know, a third of the American workforce was still in agriculture. Now it's about 2% of the workforce is in agriculture. So, you know, um, there's an old story about um, a guy goes into the Department of Agriculture, goes in, fourth floor, you know, eighth office, you know, on the right, goes in, walks into the room, there's a bald guy at the his desk, just bawling, just crying, tears rolling down his cheeks. And this gentleman says, sir, why are you so sad today? The guy says, because my, my farmer died. <laughs> I mean, we've got to make one bureaucrat every time. We can get rid of those people. If that government's funding, you're going to get uh, you're going to get too. So it's not complicated. I think, you know, if we get, I'll just end on this, I'm so optimistic about the U.S. economy. I think if we get a regime change in November, you're going to see the biggest boom. You're going to see like the 1980s and 1990s. I'll show you what a boom looks like. I'll show you what a boom looks like. Can, we, can you put that back up? Or just show you one last. Where is this? This is it. So you want to see how you can change an economy almost overnight. I'll just end you with this. This is the stock market over the last 50 years. For those of you in the finance markets, you look at this every day. The blue line is just the S&P 500 over the last 50 years since the late 1960s. 
The green line, I've just made a change because I've adjusted the uh, returns for inflation. Because you, those of you who are in my markets, you know you're interested in your after inflation, not your before inflation rate of return. But look at this. So um, here's, the, here's the period of what I call the three stooges of the American presidency. Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Just get, didn't get any worse than that, right? <laughs> Horrible results. Look what happened. The stocks lost two-thirds of their value from 1969 through 1982. Uh, the worst period for the stock market since the Great Depression. And then look at this. You want to see a boom? Look what happened from 1980 to 2000. 1982 to 2000. That is the greatest period of wealth creation in the history of civilization. No, no country's ever lived through anything like that. The net worth of the U.S. economy in 1980 was uh, something like um, $16 trillion. By the end of uh, 2000, the net worth wasn't $16 trillion, it was 40. So we created more wealth in 20 years than we did in the 200 years prior to that. Why did it happen? Why did it happen? And the answer is very simple. The clouds dispersed, the sun came out. And God gave him work around Reagan. <laughs> I'm not saying that Donald Trump, I'm not saying that Donald Trump is out Reagan far from it. Uh, but if we get somebody who is pro-business and wants the Americans and is actually putting America first, you're gonna see a big deal. And we are gonna make America. Thank you very much.